the market is looking for revolutionary results, but it really takes an evolutionary approach. I mean, this isn't easy, changing chemical pathways, changing feedstocks you're using, but the opportunity is very large. A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome back to The Chemical Show. Today, I am speaking with Eric Bober, who is a vice president at Nexton ECA and is the regional head of the America's practice. Eric leads Nexton's global green chemicals team, which we're going to be talking a bit about, um, and has some expertise in ammonia and urea, methanol, and other really important segments of the industry. He's been with Nexton for several years and has led over 50 engagements, and a lot of his experience actually comes from other operating companies in the chemical industry, which you might get to hear about that a little bit. Here's a fun fact for you. Eric is a referral from his brother, Scott Bober, who was on episode 116 of The Chemical Show. So if you haven't listened to that, go and listen. Um, you maybe can send both Eric and Scott a note and give them their pros and cons and what they did differently. But anyway, it's just a great, fun connection. So Eric, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thanks. Thanks very much, Victoria. Glad to have you here. So let's get started with your origin story. What got you interested in chemical? How, maybe how did both you and your brother get into the chemical industry? And how has your career evolved and progressed to where you are today? So in high school, when I was a kid, um, I was good at math. I was good at chemistry. I actually had a chemistry teacher in high school that really set the direction for me. And then eventually my younger brother who followed in my footsteps. Um, and our, our dad always taught us to be ambitious. And so I had chemistry, I had math, I put it together, went to school for chemical engineering. Um, coming out of school, I went into the chemical industry to work as a product development engineer, went back to business school for an MBA, concentration in finance, and went back to industry, worked for a manufacturer for a bit over 10 years in a series of roles in operations management, product management, and then marketing strategy. And then I jumped to consulting in the late 90s. So I've been in consulting for over 25 years now. I worked for one firm for a bit over 10 years again and worked a bit with circularity, worked a bit in recycling. Um, I had experience with lignocellulosic feedstocks and I joined Nexon in 2009 really because of Nexon's expertise already at that time in sustainability and in helping clients make the transition into sustainability. I, um, I guess I didn't appreciate, first of all, that Nexon had that sustainability focus all the way back in 2009. So that's, that's interesting. Here's a, here's a side question for you. Um, so chemical engineer with an MBA, when you went and did your MBA, did you expect to rejoin the chemical industry? It's interesting thought I would go into finance. That's what most of my friends were doing. And the summer in between years in business school, I got a job in equity research and that became my dream. I would be the chemical industry analyst for one of the big Wall Street banks. But it, I just didn't really enjoy equity research. It just wasn't um, substantive enough for me. I missed the industry. I missed being in the plants and, and working actually um, for operators in the industry. So that's why I went back to work for an operator. So I'm also chemical engineer with an MBA and I thought I was going to be in consulting, like big firm, McKinsey, Deloitte, Mercer, one of the big consulting firms. I actually did get some consulting offers coming out of business school. But what I realized is I hated the lifestyle. Oh. 
Um, and certainly at that time, and, and with the pandemic, things have shifted a little bit, although I think they're shifting back. But certainly at that time, 25 years ago or whatever, the um, consultants were really road warriors. I mean, they were traveling 90% of the time, working ridiculously long hours. And I well, it's the realization of nobody I've met looks healthy, which tells me that they're not really living a healthy lifestyle, which was not the lifestyle that I wanted. So I ended up joining Shell, coming out of business school. They had a, a great program at the time. So again, not necessarily the path that I thought I would join, but once you start assessing other options, you're like, Oh, yeah, this is pretty darn good. Let me go back and make an impact there. Right. And yeah. we don't do yeah. the type of consulting where we're on the road all the time. Um, we're more seeped really in the technologies and, and in the markets. Um, so we travel, but not all the time. All right. Makes sense. Well, and that's actually a really good segue. So tell us a little bit about Nexon ECA, because uh, everybody may not be familiar or maybe we're familiar with the Nexon part. For me, certainly that was the case. And then ECA comes up and I'm like, huh, what is this? So, so tell us a bit about who you guys are and what you do. Sure. So we were founded as Nexent with basically two major businesses coming together. It was the old Chem Systems consulting business and a business within Bechtel Engineering, which was included their engineering consulting business. So that's how we were founded. Uh, a couple of years ago, we spun off a couple of peripheral businesses. So now we're, we've rebranded as Nexon ECA, Energy and Chemicals Advisory. We're totally focused on advising companies in the industry. We provide an expert independent view of the sector. Um, and what we've been doing a lot of lately is helping clients satisfy the need for sustainability while taking a pragmatic approach to profitability. Hmm. We, what does that mean? But that's a nice statement, but what does that really mean? Well, you sustain has a lot of people interested in it, but there are things that make sense and things that don't make sense. And there are opportunities to add to profitability, um, but you have to select the right opportunities at the right time and then execute well. Got it. And so I think of you guys, uh, I think of Nexon, Nexon ECA now, um, as really technically focused, like on the technology maybe from that perspective more than from a market perspective. Do, is that true? Are you guys technology first or how would you describe that? We do both expertise on both sides, technical as well as market. We use sort of a techno-economic approach to our consulting. Um, we have consultants around the world. Our primary offices are in Houston and New York, London, which is world headquarters in Bahrain, Kuala Lumpur and Bangkok. And we do span the entire um, spectrum of services for clients. I think we are well known for the technology and that's a big part of our business, but we do a lot of work on the market side as well. Great. So what have you seen, you know, there's no doubt that in the last five years, so all of the 2020s, let's just say, there have been a lot of changes. What are you seeing from where you sit with yourself and Nexon in terms of what are the most significant changes in the industry in the past five years and what's really driving those changes? It has been the move to sustainability and it's being driven by both carrots and sticks. Um, the carrots include just a, an underlying growth um, from consumers, a growing interest from consumers in sustainability. And then that goes to customers of the chemical industry and customers are demanding improved sustainable improve from the chemical industry. Um, there's also subsidies. And so where consumers aren't driving it, um, governments are providing carrots to get people there and it's changing applications. It's changing applications for specific chemicals. It's opening opportunities for some. Um, and then where those car working, there's also the sticks of policies, policies and regulations. Yeah. And I've had a, a, some conversations recently about some of those policy, um, the lack in the policy, let's just call it in terms of the sense that some of these policies may not be fully, not necessarily that they're not science-based, because I don't want to have that debate because people will debate what science is and is not. But I think more importantly that, um, 
there's not necessarily solution, practical operational solutions to achieve some of the, the goals that um, our regulators have set out across the globe when I think about net zero goals and other goals. So that seems to me like it's a, a real challenge for the companies that are really trying to drive there and make that happen, right? So you need the incentives to make it happen in order to be able to meet those regulatory and the, the sticks, as you say, the carrot and the sticks work together. Yeah, in a sense, the market is looking for revolutionary results, but it really takes an evolutionary approach. I mean, this isn't easy, changing chemical pathways, changing feedstocks you're using, but the opportunity is very large. So the opportunity is to meet that growing demand you know, for products like ammonia and, and the changing applications, I mean, for sustainably improved nitrogen-based products, you could be looking at 100 million tons of additional demand easily. In some scenarios, if all the planets aligned, could be double that. We're looking at products like ammonia to be used as a transport fuel, as a boiler fuel to displace coal. General, a, a term I used, general decolification to replace coal in as many hmm. applications as possible. And then ammonia as a, as a hydrogen carrier really has potential. If hydrogen ends up being the next big thing, ammonia could have a big role as an energy storage vehicle and a transport vehicle to move hydrogen around. I've done some work myself in just looking at some of these technologies at a higher level, much higher level than what you guys would do. And the opportunity around ammonia, I mean, it's obviously a big basic chemical and the connection to hydrogen. Who do you see really being interested in this? When you think about the companies that are driving and seeking innovation in this area, what characterizes them? It's a range of companies, really. Consumer products companies have been driving a lot of this, and we do a lot of work with consumer products companies that are looking for sustainable pathways to their packaging, to their products themselves. Um, honestly, some are just looking to do things that will improve the environment, whether it has a direct impact on their business or not. In some ways, they're trying to navigate the intersection between politics and profit by staying within regulations and guidelines, but the consumer products companies are very focused on their bottom line. Technology licensors are another one. I mean, these companies are in the business of developing, deploying these new technologies. They're very, very smart people. They're developing great innovative technologies. They sell very effectively. And in a lot of ways, our clients are those technology licensors, but we also get hired by people looking to deploy those technologies to make sure they're right for them and for their applications. Operators in general are trying to drive the innovation. And it's interesting because if you think of current players in the business, they're trying to look forward with their strategy to see where they need to be in the future, um, but they don't want to cannibalize their current business to any extent larger than they really have to. Um, and then there's project developers. Project developers, to me, are a basket of people that are underappreciated because they are looking for opportunities. They're looking for an environment where they could come in and build a project and make money. And if mm -hmm. they're looking at building projects in a sector, to me, that's an indicator that it's an attractive sector because, I mean, they're there not for their future growth of their current business. They're there really to make money. Got it. Um, yeah, so they're there. They're they're coming in, in a, on a short term basis, really developing it, figuring out how to capitalize it and monetize it, and then selling it off. Exactly. Is that right. Exactly. And the, and there's one basket that I failed to mention, which is large public groups that are helping to fund these innovative new technologies and helping to fund the transition to sustainability. So it strikes me. That one of the challenges I think we, we're all seeing this is scale, right? So again, we talk about it's an evolution, not a revolution. And part of the reason it's an evolution is because it's hard to get to full scale. I mean, when you think about world scale plants across every chemical, every product and technology, um, when we're starting to launch into newer technologies that are more green and more sustainable, it's hard to launch at the same scale. 
How do you help navigate that? Is that one of the biggest challenges you see? Or, you know, what is, where is that falling for you? It is a big challenge. And if we look at products like ammonia, methanol, for sustainably sustainable pathways to them, there are scale issues. And yeah. I mean, that's where it's, it's an evolutionary approach and not a revolutionary approach where you need to deploy at scale that can prove out the technology and then work on the scale up over time. And we actually do do a lot of work with our clients in helping them look at how scalable is this technology? How likely is it to be able to perform at larger scale? We're looking at with changes in applications, if fuel opens up as an application for methanol or for ammonia, for example, I mean, we're looking at the need for multiple new plants per year for those products. And that assumes they're at world scale. So yeah. it'll require a lot of build out, but you have to get started. You have to get started somewhere. On the other hand, there are some technologies that are going big right at the outset. So out, um, I, I was out west in, in the western part of the U.S. last week on a construction monitoring visit for what will be the world's largest hydrogen, green hydrogen production and storage facility. And they're going big um, right at the outset. But we're also working on other green hydrogen projects that have more of a small distributed model. Um, so it'll vary. Yeah. And so green hydrogen, that's a function of where the energy or electricity for production comes from. Is that right? It is. And it, it makes green power, in effect, the key raw material for some of these products. And, and is that typically solar and wind? Is that what we're looking at or what, are we looking at something else? It is typically solar and wind. It's uh, what's interesting with this is just the, it's the value chain connection, right? It's none of this is very simple to get to and all the pieces have to line up um, in order to, and, and from a scale perspective, all the pieces have to line up. They do, they do. And it's driving a regionality in the business. And, you know, for ammonia and methanol, it's been a regional yeah. business because access to available low cost natural gas has typically been a big driver. But now you're looking at access maybe to renewable natural gas or maybe landfill gas mm. or to power, green power for electro electrolysis of water to generate hydrogen. But you also need an infrastructure. So you still need yeah. a place where it's straightforward to build and operate a plant. So you need access to labor for construction and for operations. You need access to maintenance personnel and spare parts and infrastructure to get raw materials in and products out. Yeah. So I know you referenced this project that you visited recently in the Western U.S. Where else are you seeing a lot of these, let's just take green hydrogen and some of these other green technologies from a regional perspective, where are they being built? What, what does that look like? Each region has sort of its own specific pluses and minuses, but you're seeing them here in the United States. There's good potential for them in South America where you have wind and solar resources. So we've seen interest there. Of course, in Europe, where regulations are trying to encourage things like this. And, you know, in, in Western Europe in particular, where you've traditionally had high cost gas and high cost power, changing the raw material mix could have a positive impact. It, it, projects there could look very good relative to what they've had in the past. And then yeah, also- Well, that'll be interesting. It will be interesting. Uh, as I, as I've mentioned before on the podcast, I think Europe is its own mess at the moment. And, and the regulations have made it very difficult to be a cost-effective producer. So if we can see a path to creating more opportunity through, whether it be green hydrogen, whether it be ammonia, whether it be something else, I think that would be great just for Europe in general, the European economy. Agreed. Agreed. And then you were starting to mention some place off other than Europe. Well, Asia, Asia Pacific. Um, we're seeing interest there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then one of the things you mentioned to me before, uh, before we got on the call, you were talking about color, that there seems to be a revolution, not just when we talk about uh, maybe green hydrogen or maybe that part of the story, but, you know, the question is really, is there, what is the color? What are we talking about when we talk about colorful technologies and um, is there a pot of gold? at the end of that rainbow. 
Yeah, that's, that's terminology we use internally to talk about it. I've been trying to talk about sustainably improved products instead of mm-hmm. getting into all those colors, but our, our clients are asking about it. They're asking if they need to add color, you know, some color to their product mix. What does that mean when you say that? So, you know, blue products are made primarily in traditional ways, but emissions are captured and dealt with. Got it. Um, green yeah. will have green feedstocks. So like we talked about green hydrogen, for example, but then there's, there's pinks and turquoises. You start to get nuclear power into the mix. Yeah. And, um, the clients are asking about it, but they're asking what's viable. I mean, are these colorful technologies viable? What scale, as you mentioned, are they today? What scale could they be in the future? What's the cost, cost to build and cost to produce? Could they get a price premium if they move into a a colorful product? Could they make money from it? I mean, really, they're asking, are any of these colors prettier than gray? And and the answer, do you have one? It depends. It depends. (laughs) It's really a case-by-case basis. There are opportunities to move to sustainably improved products and make money. But there are proposals out there for things that look less attractive. Yeah. So I know we started talking about some of the drivers for this being consumer product company. Um, And yet, are they looking this far back in the value chain, thinking about green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green and blue ammonia? Or do you see that more as we get into specialty material? Where is their interest? How far back in the value chain are they interested? It varies. Some of them are focused on what they buy and, and, and then what they put to market because increasingly people are talking about consumer products companies having to take back empty packaging, them being responsible okay. for it post use. Right. But some of them are specifically looking back in the value chain for raw material streams. We've worked with some clients who for example, um, I'm, I'm trying to navigate confidentiality. Yeah, We're, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, um, you know, some want to use emissions and wastes to produce their products, so they're looking for those kinds of of streams as raw materials for their value chains. Others are quite concerned about post use and recycling and making sure that their products once used and discarded or dealt with in responsible ways and come back into value chains. So it varies. Yeah, that the whole post-consumer use, um, or let's just start with the consumer, consumer use and then beyond is so challenging because it really requires changing human behavior, right? Um, my oldest daughter, when she she started college as an environmental science major. She's now a computer science major, which um, fits her better. And I'm happy about that. But I remember asking her, like, like, do you guys recycle your water bottles? No. It's just too hard. And not just her, but collectively. Like, on college campuses, as, as environmentally conscious um, these students are, at least in terms of what they're speaking, their actions aren't supporting the same thing. And I think so that's the individual behavior. Then there's the, the partnerships that are needed with the trash disposal companies that to enable this. So it's really complicated when we start thinking about post-consumer use because the infrastructure is not there. Back to your infrastructure discussion, the infrastructure and the behaviors just aren't there. Yeah, the, the individual behavior is hard. The people in the waste value chain are actually working yeah. effectively on technologies to improve yeah. everything they can do, but we need to increase the supply. And, and that's it's companies, company-wide policies, as well as individuals. I also, I was at a, a meeting recently with a couple of dozen people and I drank a couple of bottles of water and when I looked to discard them, there were, you know, there were only gray garbage cans. And I asked, is right. there recycling? And there, there wasn't. And right. it's, it's, right. it's easy if you, I mean, you should, we should be getting to people in, in college. Um, we should be getting to them at well, home before, before then, college. Really? Yeah. 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 I had a similar experience. I was speaking at a chemical company and one of their 
business meetings and they had recycling for aluminum, but there was not a single place for recycled plastic. Right. I'm like, Kate, like fix it in your own shop. If you're not willing to make the change yourself, it's hard to implement the change elsewhere. And of course, again, there's all these stories and, and I didn't push them on it, but it's, um, it's surprising, right? It's really surprising when you go out in the world, out in the wild, so to speak, um, and, and see the easy wins that aren't happening. It's unfortunate. Yeah. So when we, you know, we're sitting here at the beginning of 2024, which is kind of shocking because I'm not sure I'm ready to be at the beginning of 2024, but that's okay. Um, what should we be looking for? What, what are you saying that's coming up next when we think about the industry? What should we be looking for from next? And uh, what's the year ahead for you? It's interesting. It's, it's really a fun time to be working in this sector. Our employees are, are very excited about what they do. They love their work. We're adding a lot of value for clients. Clients are really able to leverage our decades of experience to allow them to develop an informed view of the future. I think we'll continue along this path towards sustainability. I think it has momentum now. There are just, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of things that just make sense. And I'd like to see those things deployed. For us at Nexon ECA, we're, we're growing. We're just, we're really busy with work on the transition to sustainability and it's, it's fun. How big is your company, PeopleWise, by the way? So we're about 115 consultants globally, uh, organized in three regions. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are busy and growing. Busy and growing. That's exciting. It is exciting. It's exciting. It is. Yeah. And it's, uh, and frankly, it's great for the industry. I think it's a great renaissance um, that we need to come up, you know, the new technology, new opportunities, new growth in a more sustainable future. Yes. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you for joining me today on the Chemical Show. It's been great. I really enjoyed myself. Thanks very much for having me. Awesome. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Keep listening, keep following, keep sharing, and we will talk with you again soon. Thank you. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.